Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Let me turn that off. Oh. Well. What a lovely day it is. Oh. Got no camera in my car. And I'm too late. Can't go can't go back and get it, so you'll just have to put up with me. Sorry about that. Anyway, if you put these things on 1.5 speed, I do. 1.4 if you can, it's comfortable. Well, providing there's not too much background noise, you know, where you are. Today I want to talk about the review body, Doctors and Dentists review body. And I'm talking about it because it's in the news at the moment. The, uh, come to light that the government has proposed a 1% pay rise for nurses and nurses are up in arms about this they want 12% because they're angels blah 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 and they uh, all uh, want to be on £100,000 a year apparently they're on £34,000 a year which to be honest is more than I earn so you know I know what it's like to be on the wrong end of uh, the government when it comes to arguing over the review body. The government ha has a series of review bodies. They have one on armed forces pay and they have one on, uh, I don't know, firemen's pay, I think. They had to set that up when they got into an industrial dispute with the firemen. Then they banned the firemen from going on strike and then set up a review body. Mike Penning was very famously a ex-fireman who became a health secretary. Big red face brash mountain of a man who looked like he'd be more at home with his hand up a cow's bum than he would uh, talking about whether or not dental students should uh, rack up a load of debt uh, before they pay up pay back a ton of tax when they qualify anyway uh, not an intellectual I'm afraid but um, no the uh, fireman's got a one the uh, doctors and dentists have got one which is the one I gave evidence to several times both in writing and uh, as part of the GDPA delegation. And, you know, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about how they work. They work in, uh, I don't think they work very well, but they seem to work very well for the purpose for which they're intended, which is, there we go, thank you. Which is to sort of set up a firewall between the government and the and the pay group, so that the government can distance themselves from a series of uh, lacklustre pay awards and say it's not us, it's the review body, you know, that's done this. And sure enough, you know, there's a series of government ministers and and uh, op Labour opposition leaders on the telly this morning saying that. You know, whatever happened, they would abide by the uh, recommendation of the pay review body. Well, you might think that the pay review body is, you know, can arrive at its own opinion on what uh, <laughs> what to recommend, and then then the government then uh, uh, then implements it. But that's that's absolutely not how it works because that would give the pay review uh, review body power over the government, wouldn't it? it would allow the pay review body to set government policy. Uh, it would allow the pay review to, uh, body would be and end up being more powerful than the treasury. So the way it works is that uh, the pay review body takes evidence from both sides, and this is because they're basically lazy. They're a bunch of industrialists who uh, treat it as a day out, meet their friends, and uh, don't really want to do too much thinking. And so, um, uh, and so, what they do is they say to the two sides, "You do all the hard work. You do the evidence. You carry out the research. Uh, you do the polling, and then uh, you you give us both sides, and then we'll do the old uh, Roman emperor's, you know, thumb up, thumb down to see what we think." So. <clears throat> I'll come back to that because, to be to be honest, uh, that is that is a bit of a charade, anyway. But let's just take it at face value for the time being. 
both sides put in evidence, both sides are then given a date to go and give uh, verbal evidence, we go up to London, we sit in front of this big table, like there's 20 people on the other side of this long table and there's like three or four of us on our, on our side. And, um, and then they sort of uh, mildly take the piss out of us for about an hour or two and ask us questions like, uh, would you, would you ex uh, agree that uh, it's a good idea to calculate profit by uh, deducting expenses from income? And I'm like, really, you know, they, they do, they do take the piss out of us because, and that is because of what, I'm, again, I'm going to mention later on. So what happens is that they then come out with a recommendation, right? Now, if they come out with a recommendation that is not what the government wants, then that's embarrassing for the government. So supposing the government evidence is that a 1% pay rise is, is justified, which is less than inflation at the moment. So it's a, it's a real, in real terms, it's a pay cut. Um, then what, what happens is that um, the government's put in an embarrassing position because it then might be forced to uh, not to implement it. It might, and having spent all this time saying, well, we've set up an independent pay review body uh, with the sole purpose of making sure that we're not involved in the decision and we'll accept whatever they say. And then, then if they don't accept whatever they say, then obviously it's very embarrassing for them. And the problem is that um, they, you, you know, you then hear, let's say you've got 5% or 6% or something, and, uh, and the, the, you're then told that the government, which let's face it, had its chance to put its evidence in at the first stage, has, has now o overruled the pay body. And what they do is they overrule the pay body on the grounds of um, economic necessity. They say that the, the country can't afford this pay rise at this time, therefore we are not going to implement it in full, right? And that's happened many times. And in fact, one, uh, one uh, particularly memorable year, the pay review body was so far away from the government in terms of, um, of their award that the... That the uh, chairman of the pay review body vanished <laughs> so Trevor Holdsworth was the chairman and uh, he came up with a, a, a finding that was very favourable to the doctors and the dentists and next year he wasn't the chairman anymore so so that's so that's what happens and now the problem that obviously we all have with that arrangement is it puts the profession in double jeopardy the um what happens is that the, the government, having reduced the award on the grounds of economic necessity, has no doubt built that argument already into their original uh, submission. So, for example, in their original submission, they say uh, we're recommending X percent because the economy is not doing too well at the moment. And then, if the review body doesn't agree with them, they then um, say, well, we're going to you know play our trump card, economic necessity, and reduce it anyway. So basically, the profession has got one chance to win, which is their own evidence, and two chances to lose, which is when the, the, either the government's evidence or the government's failure to implement. And quite frequently, they don't, uh, you know, they don't implement it. Now, here's where the skullduggery comes in. And, and again, this is not, I don't know this for a fact, but I do know that it's true. <laughs> which is that they're, that they're um, I refuse to believe that there's no communication between the government and their own review body on the level of pay. And to the extent that, uh, you know, the review body has got a pretty good idea of what the sort of decision they're going to be expected to make. And what they're then expected to do is to wallpaper on top of that the pretense of some independence. And this is, this is not at all uh, uncommon in government circles. You know, there are plenty of uh, bodies which are what they call the, the quasi-autonomous non-governmental organisations, or the quangos as they used to be called, um, which are, you know, arm's length bodies they're now called, which are supposedly independent of the government, but, but really used to be part of the government and may be part of the government again, and are probably still unofficially part of the government now. Um, but it just suits the governments to say, to pretend that there's some 
uh, a degree of independence in the recommendations of these uh, arm's length bodies. So that's why I say they, they mildly take the piss out of us for two hours. Because I think really they're not really interested in our evidence at all. They don't, uh, you know, but by the time they take the verbal evidence, they've already read the written evidence, they know where we're coming from, and uh, uh, they know that, uh, you know, we're, we're not, we're not going to get what we want. So, so uh, the verbal evidence is just a chance to have a bit of fun, you know, and uh, say, uh, well, you know, you've asked for 4%, um, why don't you ask for 8%? <laughs> and then we'll go, well, we think we do deserve 8%, but, <laughs> but we didn't think we'd get 8%, so we asked for 4%. And then they'll go and have a cup of tea and have a right old chortle. So, <clears throat> so anyway, the nurses uh, who are on, as I say, £34,000 anyway, but one another 12%, um, are... The, the, the politicians are all coming on and saying, oh, well, we, we, we are, we're going to abide by the results of the independent review body. The, re, the, the government offering 1% is not a, an offer. What's happened is the government, in the government's evidence to the nurses' pay review body, they've proposed a 1% rise. So that's their evidence, is that, uh, that a 1% rise is justified, which, what with inflation being, I don't know, your guess is as good as mine, anything up to 6%, uh, so, and perhaps even higher this year because of the, m the money printing, the inflation of the money supply. Um, you know, nurses are, are going to fall behind in real terms. Now, the problem with uh, falling behind in real terms is that you get less <coughs> of what you need and, and also you get less uh, quality, you know, the quality goes down. And... When I started working with the Doctors and Dentists Review Body, dentists were pretty much in the top decile of earnings. And just in case you don't know what that means, that means that if you were to split uh, the, all, of the, all of the earnings into 10 bands, from the highest band to the lowest band, dentists would be at the bottom of band one, at the top of band two. So literally, earn more than 90% of the population but less than 10% of the population. And in my opinion, that is an appropriate pay level for dentists. Now you might say, well, why, why does it make dentists so special that they need to earn more than 90% of the population? You know, all the bank managers, all the chief executives, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is that dentistry requires a unique combination of three skills. It requires academic skills, it requires business skills, and it requires manual skills, manual dexterity. And I bet off the top of your head you couldn't name me another profession that requires all three of those. Even a brain surgeon requires academic skills and manual skills, but not really business skills. You know, there's not many private brain, brain uh, operation centers in the country. So, so, so being in the top decile, or, or at, the, at the top decile, was really, I felt, an appropriate reward for the unique, the very unique skill set that you find in a dentist. And one that's not uh, likely to be um, automated or computerized in any way in the near future. And when, and I've been around since computers have been around, you know, I mean, I qualified in 82 and uh, my first uh, computer was a ZX81. So my entire career I've been told that uh, I was going to be replaced by a robot, I was going to be replaced by an artificial intelligence, uh, I was going to be replaced by uh, grafting tooth buds into people's gums so that they could grow new sets of teeth, uh, that far fewer dentists would be required, that <clears throat> my profession wouldn't exist by the time I retired. I've had to put up with 40 years of this. <laughs> and to be honest with you, this. There are fewer, it's more difficult to find a dentist now than it ever was. And uh, there's absolutely no signs at all of uh, anything I do being computerized or automated at all. You know, there's been a few uh, leap forwards in materials technology, but really, you know, otherwise nothing. So, and that's hardly surprising, you know, because you're, you're in a patient's mouth with an aerotor that's going at 
you know, I don't know, what, 600,000 RPM or whatever. Now, would you, I ask you, would you as a patient be happy if the dentist started clamping some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of framework onto your teeth, to which was attached a, a semi-autonomous uh, a drill revolving at those speeds, you know? You know, I mean, I personally want, in the same way as they're talking about uh, redesigning aircraft to be, to have a single pilot operator. Um, the reason being that uh, they are, I think, increasingly confident that they can fly planes remotely, that it can be done from the ground, and therefore uh, what you need is a pilot operator in the cockpit who could take over if the ground base control fails. So in fact you do have two pilots, it's just that you just have one on the ground and one in the air, um, instead of two in the air, as you do at the moment. But I still, again, as a passenger, you know, that's why we've had two pilots for so long. Would you trust uh, <clears throat> an airplane that was being flown from the ground autonomously um, with, with a single pilot as a backup? Knowing as we do that uh, very, very many single pilots have gone completely do lally and deliberately either, you know, uh, like MH370 flown into nowhere and disappeared, or, or uh, like the German guy who had mental health problems crashed into the ground, whatever. You know, you want you want the two people there, don't you? As a even with a dentist, the dentist and the nurse, you want the nurse there, don't you? Just in case the dentist does anything weird and the nurse says what are you doing that for <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so what happened was uh, as soon as dentists uh, fell out of the top decile of earnings it became quite apparent that uh, uh, dentistry was commoditized in a way um, it, it was it was sort of um, it changed from being a vocation to being um, you know just something that anyone could provide and and pro and there were a bunch of people there always are a bunch of people saying yes I'll provide that for less you know the you know you're a dentist you're earning I don't know 20 30 50 70 thousand pound a year and then uh, if, if dentistry is deregulated you know there are always going to be shelf stackers saying actually I don't mind doing dentistry for less than a dentist <laughs> So, you know, you're in constant competition, downward competition, because the person who's uh, able to do it the cheapest uh, to an acceptable quality, and by acceptable I don't mean to other dentists or to the state, I mean to the patient. You know, we've all had patients who come in, I used to get a lot in Whitstable in my first job, the patients would come in and say, <coughs> Oh, I used to see Mr. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I used to see Mr. You know, Blah, who uh, who shall remain nameless, and uh, he's retired now. What a lovely density was! What a gentleman! How gentle he was! Blah blah blah. And you look at their mouth, and their mouth is absolutely wrecked. I mean, there was a there was a dentist in Whistle who did no who did no periodontal treatment at all. And actually, when you spoke to him, his gums, his gums were shocking. And uh, he never did any, any gum treatment. And uh, so all his patients had teeth that were falling out. And it fell to me, because he asked me to do his locum work, um, uh, when he was away, because he spent three months of a year away in Spain, he asked me to look after his patients for him. And really, it was just, uh, I didn't know what to say to them, you know, I used to say to them, no, I think you need to come in and see the hygienist. And they were like, well, I don't see why. Was, Mr. So-and-so never told me to come and see the hygienist. So you're right, all right then. Fine. I'm wrong, he's right. Yeah, so... So then, uh, you know, I think that was the beginning of the end. And But that was fairly early on. I mean, I think that was in the 80s. That was before the uh, Department of Health decided that... Um, they could make quite considerable savings on the dental budget, um, and then, and then, of course, the whole um, service collapsed. Thank you. I'm 
I'm going to quote Ken Weech again, you know, the farmer who fed his horse a bit less every day to save money, it was a policy that worked fine until the horse died, and that's when the horse started dying in 1980s, and it was the review body that fired the first shot, you know, they, um, what uh, happened was we put our evidence in, they put their evidence in, the review body either agreed wholeheartedly with their evidence or uh, or agreed or came down somewhere in the middle and then the government then just said no we're not we're not going to do that you know we're not going to give you what they recommend and they never make it up it's not like you know the next year they say well we'll pay you it next year and then there's all sorts of shenanigans so like <coughs> you ask for one percent and they say we're not going to give you 1%, but we'll give you 3% over four years. And you're like, wait a minute, that's not even 1%. <laughs> you know, you can, we can do the maths. That's not, you know, but they do, they, they started doing these multi-year deals, which um, uh, they felt sort of kicked the can down the road a bit and gave them, the, uh, <clears throat> gave them, it's all done on uh, recruitment, retention and motivation. That's what the three the three mantras. Can they recruit enough people into the profession? Well, they always could because, as I say, they they could always recruit hairdressers into the profession. And uh, what they did was they set up all these vocational universities on the south coast and places like that to try and uh, take take people who had sort of got a, a useless degree and who didn't who, that could, couldn't give them a decent job or was a non-subject and said, look, you know, you've got a degree already, so what we'll do is we'll we'll stuff you into a pigeonhole as a dentist, give you a couple of years, three years training, and uh, you can you can call yourself a dentist. And they, um, you know, they encourage dentists to unretire, return out of retirement. Uh, those who'd had a baby and perhaps given up the profession, they encouraged them to return. And then, of course, they had a massive recruitment uh, drive overseas in places like Romania and stuff like that, European Union countries, to try and uh, get them to come over to the UK. But, but that all stopped because um, uh, immigration was so unpopular that the one year, 900,000 Poles, I think, came in to, to live, and then uh, so they decided to put a stop on that. But... Um, so recruitment really was a... They never really saw a problem with that. Retention, well, retention's not a problem if people are leaving the profession, finding you can get more new people in, especially if the new people earn less. And motivation was the only uh, thing. But <clears throat> motivation, as far as there was... As long as there was one dentist in the country that said he was accepting NHS patients, then they thought that the motivation wasn't a problem. And uh, all the time that dentists were leaving the NHS and going private, doing private conversions, joining third-party capitation plans and stuff like that, <clears throat> the government always insisted that anyone who wanted an NHS dentist could get one. Hello. Someone's ringing. Lou, Lou is going to answer that, don't worry. Come on, Lou. Pick up the phone, Lou. That's it. Yeah, so uh, the motivation really, they didn't care, but as far as they were concerned, they had too many NHS dentists anyway. So uh, if a few of them went private, then it didn't really matter. They were spending 300 million pound a year on the NHS, <coughs> which they considered was a you know a massive amount of money and far too much on a disease which is for the most part self-inflicted. And so uh, they, they uh, the motivation was, uh, they. Last thing they cared about was dentist motivation. So that's the history of the review body for you, and that's why the nurses won't get anywhere, because basically, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a nothing mechanism. It's a mechanism to do nothing and to carry on underpaying your, your workforce uh, while at the same time um, maintaining a, a sort of a, a, an appearance of a distance, appearance of independence. Appearance of fairness. Appearance of fairness. That's all it is. Not fair, just an appearance of fairness. All right, nice to talk to you. See you soon. Bye.